Hello, here we are again, talking about bipolar disorders and new perspectives. In recent years, there has been a renaissance of successfully using psychedelic drugs in the treatment of mood disorders. Indeed, combined with psychotherapy, psychedelics can be effective and can be particularly useful when other treatments have already failed. However, the treatment with psychedelics is different from other psychotropic medications, and therefore, it's worth reviewing. Psychedelics have been introduced in the treatment of psychiatric disorders mainly during the 1960s. At that time, lysergic acid diethylamide, or shortly LSD, was available as medication in pharmacies in some countries and also in their pharmacopoeias. Unfortunately, because of street abuse, LSD was later withdrawn from the market. Recently, However, psychiatrists realized the specific contribution of psychedelics and started using them again, effectively in the treatment. And so there is now a growing evidence indicating that when skillfully blended with psychotherapy, psychedelics can provide an effective and safe treatment for several major psychiatric disorders, including mood disorders. Over 150 clinical investigations of psychedelics have already been carried out. The findings do indicate that psychedelics are a useful therapeutic tool for mood and anxiety disorders, particularly for treatment-resistant depression, and they can also counteract drug dependence. Let me show some of the examples of the experimental studies with psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca. In difficult to treat depressions, the treatment effects of psychedelics have often been prompt and lasting, at times even with just one or two treatment sessions. Achieving such benefits is undoubtedly new, without a precedent in, in psychiatry. However, so far, most studies worked with relatively small patient groups, and many use open designs without placebo or other comparator. Therefore, more extensive controlled trials are presently undergoing, particularly with psilocybin and ketamine. There are important differences from other psychotropic medications. Most other psychotropic treatment, sorry, most other psychiatric treatments are given to suppress the troublesome symptoms and to reduce the abnormal activity of the brain. The patient's response is then primarily defined by the pharmacological profile of the drug. It can be repeated if a similar dosage of the same medication is given again. But the treatment with psychedelics is quite different. To trigger healing, psychedelics activate the mind, increase connectivity in the brain, and alter the oscillatory processes. They may initially even activate rather than suppress the symptoms, and then the mind later resets. The term psychedelic is a derivative of uh, the Greek words. Psyche and delaying. Psyche meaning mind, delaying meaning to manifest. It was coined uh, initially by a prominent British psychiatrist, Humphrey Osford, who later lived in Canada and in the United States. Also, in native communities, there is a long history of the use of psychedelics in physical and mental healing and spiritual and religious ceremonies. For example, native North American practitioners have used mescaline-containing cacti. Mazatec practitioners routinely use psilocybin mushrooms for healing divination. And ayahuasca is widely employed in Brazil and Peru and now moving to other countries. Pharmacologically, psychedelic substances can be divided 
into three major classes. Serotonergic agonists, serotonin releasers, and NMDA, or N-methyl diaspartate antagonists, that are related to glutamate function. Serotonergic psychedelics comprise LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, and ibogain. The serotonin receptor 2A agonism is suspected to be the pharmacological trigger of the psychedelic experience. This explanation is based on the fact that the effects of LSD can be entirely blocked by ketanserin, a selective 5-HT2A receptor antagonist. Serotonin releasers, or, quote, empathogens, unquote, are phenylethylamine derivatives, such as MDMA and MDA. And the NMDA antagonists include ketamine. These three psychedelic groups usually induce rather similar psychophysiological effect. They depend on the dosage of psychedelic drug, and they can be described in broad terms such as enhanced emotional activity, augmented mental and psychodynamic processes, and perceptual changes. Many users have reported that the three groups of psychedelics have subjectively somewhat different qualities. For example, after the ingestion of LSD, many subjects initially experience kaleidoscopic visions. The use of ayahuasca tends to include nausea and vomiting. MDMA and MDA effects are typified by feelings of euphoria, increased empathy, and mild audio and visual distortions. The applications of ketamine tends to produce sensations of being disconnected from one's body and the surrounding environment, also feelings of dissociation and unreality. However, it is really not the pharmacological, but the non-pharmacological factors that are fundamental determinants of what the person experiences after ingestion. True systematic comparisons of different psychedelics, of course, have not yet been feasible as long as they have been illegal. Every psychedelic experience is really unique. It is usually heavily described in feelings and images and cannot be adequately described verbally. Words do not suffice in particular when the psychedelic encounter takes the form of a mystical experience, the way it has been described for centuries in various spiritual traditions. Mystical experiences may be the most profound experiences in the individual's life, and for the person may explain the meaning and purpose of their lives. The pharmacological effect is an essential trigger of the psychedelic experience, but it is the non-drug factors, such as set and setting, the individual characteristics of the subject, and the supporting uh, therapies that place great importance in determining the nature of psychedelic experience. The subject's life situation, uh, the, at the time of the session, his or her expectations, beliefs, the relevant physiological, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual problems are all very important. The content of the experience the subject describes has a definite predilection for material that carries a strong emotional charger, charge for the individual. Another important variable is the therapist's approach to the session, his personality makeup, the therapeutic relationship with the client. It often seems that during the session, the participant intensely perceives the emotions of the persons present. The setting of the psychedelic session uh, also has, is a very important variable. Different settings activate different elements from the unconscious of the subject. Similarly, various stimuli from the surroundings 
particularly the people involved, play an essential modulating role. And there are also collective in influences involved. These influences together differ not only from subject to subject, but usually also very uh, considerably from session to session in the same subject. In his extensive lifelong research, my brother Sten identified three broad categories of experiences that emerge during psychedelic sessions, biographical, perinatal, and transpersonal. The description of uh, these experiences have been extricated from the observations of more than 30,000 sessions, sessions with non-ordinary states of consciousness induced either by psychedelic or by holotropic breath, work, breath, holotropic breath work. The biographical material includes, in particular, emotionally high relevant events from the subject's life. They may stretch from early childhood to the present day. During psychedelic sessions, individuals often confront earlier emotional and physical traumas and conflicts. These recollections from the person's life have rich sources. They may reflect strangulated emotional energies from inappropriate child rearing, hostile family atmosphere, sibling rivalry, emotional deprivation, um, this number of things, even un unattended infant needs, physical and sexual abuse, or memories of serious illnesses, physical illnesses, accidents, and operations. Specific constellations of recalls and associated phenomena from different life periods of the individual become activated by the psychedelic. They usually share the same emotional quality as if some program tied together memories that have the same emotional attribute. Perinatal experiences fall into four different categories, uh, four different matrices corresponding to the four stages of human birth. They reflect experiences encountered while the person was progressing during one's own birth. Transpersonal experiences pose a particular challenge to the verbal description. Because in the daily life, we usually describe events in terms of the Newtonian linear space-time, while transpersonal experiences usually transcend the, the concept of time advancing sequentially and the space being three-dimensional. Transpersonal experiences expand beyond such boundaries. Nevertheless, time and space in transpersonal experiences are congruent with the ideas of quantum physics. During the sessions, the subject's usual mental abilities seem to markedly expand. They may be able to reach outside the usual time range, for example, to ancestral, fetal, perinatal, or even precognitive experiences. Similarly, the individual's perception of space may expand and reach intuitively to events not available to the person's senses. The subject may experience, for example, full identification with the mind of other persons or other groups, with humanity altogether, with animals, plants, or even information in inorganic matter. The experiences may include, quote, remote viewing, unquote, of locations far removed from the subject or visit what appears to be a tissue and cellular consciousness. The subject may also identify with archetypal or some universal forces. All these experiences and their categories are well captured in Stan Groff's books. Uh, for example, The Realms of the Human Unconscious, holotropic mind, LSD psychotherapy, or LSD doorway to the numinous. Obviously, most of these experiences are based on information the mind obtains intuitively, outside of the person's sensory channels. 
they really cannot be explained within the contemporary mechanistic concept of the human mind. The mechanistic view of the human awareness has prevailed for a long time now. And it has been based on the assumptions that first, human memory only starts recording our experiences sometime after the birth. And second, that the brain somehow generates, produces the human consciousness, utilizing the neurons and the neuronal networks. However, there is now a large body of experiments, investigations, and observations that are just not compatible with these simple mechanistic assumptions. They are reviewed in recent articles and books, for example, by internist Larry Dosey, psychologist Charles Start, philosopher Erwin Laszlo, and they indicate that in addition to the brain, there's also a human consciousness not dependent on the brain, so-called non-local consciousness. Furthermore, the discoveries from all hard sciences during the 20th century point out that in nature, there obviously is a large number of new, interconnected, not yet measured fields. In addition, the observations from the psychedelic experiences themselves contradict those mechanistic assumptions that I mentioned. The retrievals of verifiable personal information from perinatal and prenatal life and verifiable transpersonal information are incompatible with and dispute the mechanistic approach. The brain obviously cannot generate any transpersonal information that did not previously receive through its sensory channels. Thus, transpersonal experiences definitely and perinatal and prenatal personal experiences possibly must come from some other non-local source. So, an intense search for some new, other, more complete interpretations of the human mind is going on. An explanation that would be compatible with the new findings and observations. One possible source might, for example, be some field surrounding the brain. The studies of the brain utilizing the ingestion of psychedelic substances could then suggest that the brain may be involved primarily via creating the propensity for non ordinary states of consciousness by markedly increasing the activation, connectivity, and oscillatory processes in the brain. The notion that the brain participates mainly in creating predisposition for non ordinary mind states would also be compatible with the vast body of observations about depressions and manias. They are also non ordinary mind states. A large number of biological abnormalities have been documented during major depressions and manias. And while these abnormalities are different quantitatively between mania and depression, amazingly, these abnormalities are qualitatively of the same type, regardless of whether the patient is depressed or manic. In other words, whether the patient is experiencing enormous heaven or hell. This seems to suggest that while the biological abnormalities in the brain are an important part of the process, they do not determine the huge variety and the content of the subjective experiences. Now, the idea that a field surrounding the brain would participate in the functioning of human consciousness may sound like a very radical, far-out concept a vast departure from the prevailing beliefs. But the problem is, everyone can have a theory of how the mind works during psychedelic experiences. But eventually, one has to account for the results of experimental findings and systematic observations. Throughout its history, science already had to accommodate many seriously heretical concepts, most recently, of course, from quantum physics. Finally, a few points we know about the processes in the brain associated with non ordinary states of consciousness. 5-HT2A receptor agonism 
is known to be the pharmacological trigger of the, quote, psychedelic experience, unquote. The administration of psychedelics is accompanied by a marked increase of the brain activity and characterized by increased connectivity of neural networks as well as with markedly changed oscillatory activities. From the functional perspective, the outstanding British uh, researcher Robin Carthard Harris and his co-workers investigated the effects of psychedelics with the help of functional MRI, brain imaging. Compared to placebo, the administration of psilocybin led to a marked increase in the connectivity of the brain. We know that at the same time the oscillatory processes start op operating and they operate above the ceiling of the individual's usual oscillatory range. Let me then expand a bit on the role of the oscillations in the genesis of psychedelic experiences. Now, any subject that has ever ingested a psychedelic notices that the non-ordinary experiences evolve in waves, in oscillations. And wave after wave, the subject enters non-ordinary states of mind. First, the experiences emerge in recurrent episodes, but then with shorter and shorter intervals in between. Then they may persist full-fledged for some period of time, but subsequently start abating with exponentially longer and longer intervals in between. Finally, isolated, quote, flashbacks, unquote, may emerge for some time, as is common in gradually lessening oscillating processes. And these flashbacks may appear after months and months. The oscillations that the psychedelic substance triggers in the brain play a role in how predisposed the mind is for non-ordinary experiences and how intense they will be. The oscillatory processes take place at different levels of the brain, from neuron to neuronal networks. These oscillating waves create predisposition both for a variety of non-ordinary experiences, from, for example, falling in love and probably spiritual emergence, to abnormal moods such as depression and mania, so a range of experiences. They also seem to play a role in physiologically induced non-ordinary states experienced during holotropic breathwork. Um, I also want to point out that very uh, dynamic description of the processes on Carthard Harris's TED talk, and there you have the, the uh, refer to the internet. Um, as an example of the oscillatory processes, on the next slide I show oscillations in the brain of one of our subjects measured monthly over four years and represented schematically. And this is just a four-year cut out of 40 year of monthly follow-up. Also, on the next two slides, I show a simplified scheme of how oscillations in the brain may maintain balance during ordinary states. You see the oscillations within the range of the individual. And then during non-ordinary states, where the oscillation overshoots the, the ceiling of, of the usual range. So one can presume that this also happens with psychedelics. This undulating development is unlike taking a non-psychedelic drug, where the effect starts and from then on persists until the drug is metabolized and the effect stops. Psychedelics, however, initiate and for a while maintain this oscillating process. What we then experience is more a process of learning about expanded oneself rather than some specific effect of a drug. So, in summary, psychedelic experiences are triggered by the administration of the psychedelic drug, but then are influenced mainly by non-drug factors and molded in particular by the mental set of the individual 
and the setting of the session. So resulting experience um, can be utilized therapeutically in persons suffering from mood disorders, utilized for healing and profound inner restructuring. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.